Welcome everyone to Character Spotlight. It is such a joy, such an honor for me to be hosting today and interviewing Peter Ray. Peter is the Vice President for Integrity and Ethics at Parker Hannifin and also one of the co-authors of this amazing book, Exception to the Rule, The Surprising Science of Character-Based Culture, Engagement and Performance. Peter, welcome to Character Spotlight. Thank you, Arthur. Appreciate you asking me to be part of this. I am so excited to, I have so many questions to ask you. Let's just get going. And, um, you know, first, Parker Hannifin, tell us a little bit about what the company does. Yeah, so it, Parker Hannifin would not be on most people's radar screen because it would be known as a business to business. So the brief story is it's actually over 100 years old. Arthur Parker um, figured out ways to do brakes and fuel systems, which this starts to implicate what it does. So fast forward, Parker is the number one motion and control company in the world. Mm -hmm. So what does that mean? You see anything that moves, there's going to be a part, a subsystem, or a whole system of Parker stuff on it. So Spirit of St. Louis, if you went to the Smithsonian Institute, you would see the fuel system is Parker. And you fa fast forward, you couldn't have a ventilator without Parker stuff. There's about 17 parts or subsystems on a ventilator. So it, it, it's an every, it, it's kind of like the Intel of manufacturing, yeah. all yeah. this stuff that you kind of take for granted that makes mm. modernity possible, that's Parker. Uh, Fortune 250 company sales mm. over 14 billion. So that's a we, we operate in 50 countries, 350 <laughs> locations. So roughly speaking, that's the version of what Parker does. And you are the vice president for integrity and ethics. Tell me, when you were 10 years old, was that your dream, you know, job? Is that what you were aiming for when you were 10? When I was 10, I think my title would have been vice president of being a knucklehead that the only thing I cared about was hitting, throwing, and catching a ball. I, I don't think I would have a single teacher that would have said that I could have pulled this off, and I would have agreed with them. Mm, mm. Uh, how did you come to be vice president? Well, can tell us a little bit about your journey to, to where you are now. Yeah, in some ways, Arthur, I look at it and say, I don't know how the hell it happened. But, uh, <laughs> There sure was no big plan. I mean, a lot. There's a randomness to this stuff. Um, so, so the short story is um, academic by background. Um, orient my specific discipline is in strategy. Mm -hmm. When I was younger, I used to think that being right was enough. That if you just got the competitive advantage clear and you execute it, you're good to go. Pretty dismissive, if I'm honest, about culture and leadership. I thought, crap, everybody knows that. You don't need to tell anybody that. It's common sense. And then the older you get, you realize, holy cow, you know, if the strategy was reasonably good and the culture was brilliant, you'll be fine. Mm -hmm. If you've got brilliant people, brilliant strategy, and a bunch of folks that have got sharp elbows and the culture stinks, good luck. Yeah. So that's when I started to morph to, I got to do a better job understanding the culture. Uh, and I've, I've dismissed the part that's most important. You usually don't need to, to get people to understand that culture is more powerful than strategy. Trouble is the culture doesn't have a lot of clarity what that means and tools. Yeah. And I thought a lot of the business literature on culture, um, it stated the problem well, but I thought the concepts were kind of weak. Yeah. And that's when I got interested in the virtues that I thought, well, this, there's a reason why this stuff's been around for thousands of years. That's where the interest started. Yeah. You know, uh, you talk about the virtues in the book, uh, trust, compassion, courage, justice, wisdom, and hope. So those are the seven virtues that we're going to be talking about uh, for the rest of our time together. But I'd like to ask about Parker's Genesis story, not how it started as a company, but how did it begin to really deeply and intentionally integrate these, these virtues, but this idea of being character based as part of the company's sort of, you know, reason for being. Could you talk a little bit about what sort of ignited that? What, what was there a moment where it all came to, to fruition for the company? 
It's a great question, Arthur. And I would put it this way and give a couple of uh, background checks to explain this. I think the virtues have always been part of Parker. It just didn't have the language. Mm. The reason I say that is Arthur Parker, when the company was founded in the early 1900s, he actually had a tagline about we need to do this. We need to do fair dealings defines oh. the way we do business. So he's really talking about justice. Yeah. Uh, and then his son, uh, th there's kind of this interesting piece from early, right after World War One. after World War II, he died of a heart attack and his widow um, was advised by the, uh, all their, the, the, the fiduciary agent said, you know, you need to sell the company. So after World War II, you kind of had one dominant customer, the US military, um, and you've got young kids, you just need to sell this. And she, did, she didn't do it. She mm. said, no, I think the, um, the, the, the heritage of this company, what it stands for, need, needs to live on. So she literally was putting her family's future at stake and took the money from the insurance policy to continue that, which that single decision now employs nearly 60,000 people. Mm. And then her son took over, uh, who also had the same view of character and, and treating people fairly and with respect and dignity. So, you know, when I stepped in, Arthur, there had been 80, 90 years of uh, culture that had already embraced this. So yeah. the real issue was, was I going to screw this up because it was already in a good place? <laughs> That's a great answer. Thank you. It just, I think it helps people to know, um, you know, this Genesis story. So let's, let's shift a little bit to uh, the seven virtues. Let's just imagine a new employee starting at Parker, you know, on Monday, you know, how is she, how is he going to kind of learn about the company's focus on the seven virtues and on the importance of character at Parker? How does that happen? Yeah. So um, what I would not want to build a case that we've got a production worker in Shanghai, China, every single one of them can spout off all seven virtues. I think that would be a reach on my part. Um, what I can say is that at this stage, um, just kind of briefly explain the organizational structure of Parker that answers your question. We have six operating groups. Each of these operating groups, the tiny ones about 1.5 billion, the larger ones are 3 billion, all that adds up to about 14 and a half billion. Underneath them are 88 divisions with separate profit and loss responsibilities. So the real action of Parker happens within these divisions. So they all have their own kind of perspective. Uh, it would be rare today, this wasn't true when I started, but I think it would be rare today that the leadership team uh, wouldn't be quite familiar with the virtues and is then trying to imagine, all right, here's the goals that we have. Here are the activities, there are priorities to achieve those goals. Now, how would virtue enhance our performance? What would mm. it look like? So I think the direct answer to your question is I'm likely to hear about it from the leadership team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great. Uh, is, is there one though um, activity, if there's one company-wide uh, moment where the idea of character, the idea of integrity uh, really sort of coheres in, in this company-wide moment? Is there anything that really, you know, character day or trust right. day, is there anything that really you're proud of that you've been able to integrate in a way that it really is not just taught and it's not just caught in terms of, you know, seeing leaders model, but it's, it's, it's also sought. Okay, that's the kind of person I wanna be. Is there right. any, anything that really happens at this very large company where you're just so proud of because you know it's sticking. Yeah, the sticky part, the way I would put it is it happens in daily operations. So mm -hmm. it's not so much a single event or a single activity, but it's more, um, this, you know, you don't need to convince people of the benefits of things like compassion and courage. It's how do we actually practice this? So the framing is these virtues are happening to us every single day, whether we're paying attention to them or not. Mm -hmm. They're having a favorable or a disfavorable impact on performance. And we're all teaching these virtues, whether or not we're aware of it or not. 
So the only real question is how good of a job am I doing when it comes to teaching and practicing the virtues? Yeah. And so the really hard part, I think, is the habitual side of how do you take these ideas on a daily basis and plop them in there in a way that it becomes habitual, that is both kind of strategically smart and a better way to live. That's where the stickiness uh, yeah, comes in. Uh, I just had this question that uh, popped into my head. Imagine those 88 division uh, leaders, you know, the those in charge of each division. Um, and they filled out a survey and it was it was not just a, it was really a, a, a narrative survey. And what you were really trying to get at is, hey folks, help me understand, me being you, help me understand which of these seven are most difficult to practice. I know you're trying all seven, but which one you don't have the tools, it hasn't been, habituated yet, which one of those seven, trust, compassion, courage, justice, wisdom, and hope, what do you think those 88 uh, division leaders would say is the one that is just not part of their toolbox yet? Yeah, and I've, I've done that survey kind of oh. repeatedly, so it's, it's a really good question. Um, you'll get a lot of variance in which virtues they'll kind of pick off. Um, so at the moment, it kind of depends when you're talking to folks and where they are in their journey. It inevitably, it kind of goes to your prior point of um, you, you discover it's this temperance stuff that it's actually hard. Um, and I didn't, you know, by definition, temperance is a means, it's not an end. Mm -hmm. So if I want to become more compassionate, I want to become more courageous, I want to become more just, it quickly implicates well, I've got a series of habits that either help me move in that direction or pull me away. I always like Benjamin Franklin's definition of net worth, where you took your best habits and subtracted your worst habits, and that was your, um, your net worth. Um, so we're all this mixed bag of healthy and unhealthy habits. I hope that the top number is, is bigger than the bottom number. But I, I think that's the tough nut is yeah. making this habitual where I get to the place, I mean, you're an expert in courage, where I get to the place, I actually don't even think about being courageous. I can't imagine being any other way. Yeah. But at the front end, it might be, well, for the first time, I started to be courageous, but it's not a habit yet. It was just a single event. Yeah, and so many people start at companies or in organizations, sports teams, anywhere, you know, uh, to get along, go along. And that's not courage. And so exactly. let's just move, let's move on to courage. I loved that chapter, Peter. It was really special, especially I had never uh, seen so beautifully written the distinction between good rebels and bad rebels, you know, and the examples that you gave were just so spot on, so clear to understand, you know, they, the idea that good rebel changes a rule and the bad rebel breaks the rule, right? And then, or the good rebel, this was my favorite, wonders if, wait a minute, if, if we did it, you know, where the bad rebel says, wait a minute, I'm worried about that. Uh, so talk more about how Parker really intentionally encourages employees to practice that virtue of courage. Yeah. And, and like, all, I'm going to answer your question, but also frame it in terms of, um, we practice all these virtues imperfectly. So I don't know that anyone would claim, look, I got this courage stuff down cold, I'm good. Um, so it's a more along a continuum that, that you're well aware of. So what, what does it start to look like? Um, one concrete example is um, uh, like a lot of big companies, we tend to be extraordinary at operational excellence. We're really good at acquisitions and pulling a culture in. And the struggle is on the innovation side. And innovation, by definition, means new action. So you've got this skill set of operational excellence that looks more like crop production. It's very predictable. You reduce variance. And over here, you're trying to do something brand new, which looks more like a greenhouse. And you don't know where it's going to all end up. So uh, within that, those are two really different cultures and trying to figure out how to put those two together. So the innovation is at least one 
um, demonstration of that takes courage because we don't know how this is all going to turn out. And you know, if you asked a group of people, put up your hands if you can come up with a story where uh, vulner courage was achieved without vulnerability. Yeah. I'd like to hear that. Um, so by definition, you're putting your neck out a little bit yeah. to see if, in fact, you can do something that hasn't been done before. Yeah. So that our starts to implicate the culture because we fear loss two times the level we hope for gain. That's part of the human condition. That's the lizard brain and all of that. So how do you kind of counter what is part of our humanity to fear loss, to get to the place where we can take intelligent risks? Yeah. Not crazy risk, but intelligent risk. Yeah. And there's a bunch of details to that, but that's one way to answer your question. Yeah, it's, um, you know, that lizard brain, let's, let's stay with that for a little bit, because if I'm new at Parker and I'm being evaluated, assessed for the first time, you know, I would think that there are certain targets that I have to hit, you know, and that's where the lizard brain comes in, right? I'm just going to get laser focused on that. Um, or just, hey, I'm at a company. I, I know what gets measured here. It's, you know, it's my performance. And, you know, you, you really wanted to kind of talk to me about this sort of path from performance to virtue. So could you kind of think about that in terms of that lizard brain and that idea that virtue really is having the courage to overcome that short term, this is, you know, this is what I got to do to get ahead. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I like the way you framed it too, that um, you know, courage isn't the absence of fear. It's can I overcome my fears to do what I know is right? Yeah. And uh, how much of a priority do I want to give fear? And you know, I've got to come up with methods to, to deal with that. So to get more direct to your point, let's start with kind of dependent variables that either companies or schools care about and then kind of trace it back to virtue. So going back to the innovation side, MIT is kind of an amazing organization when it comes to uh, innovation. They start 900 companies every single year. I mean, no one matches that record. So they wanted to look at return on investment. That's the dependent variable. What explains that? And roughly speaking, about two thirds, 70 percent of the time, that variance could be explained by the leadership and the team, not the idea. So it's leadership and teamwork that actually generates the wealth that you care about. Yeah. Shift over here. Let's the, the Google study that you're, you'll be familiar with, Project Aristotle. Dependent variable wasn't happiness, satisfaction, none of that. It was uh, best margins, who did the best job generating new revenue. And so let's trace it back. What's the best predictor of that? How people treat each other is a better predictor of performance than who's on the team. And it implicates things like empathy. Everybody's got a voice. I mean, psychological safety, Amy Edmondson stuff. What's, the, what's she looking for? It's always about some performance metric. And at the, that leads to, are people motivated in accountability for results? So what will get you that? Psychological safety. Yeah. What's a key factor of psychological safety? Vulnerability. We're back to courage. Yeah. And then if yeah. you look in, you know, in the fields of teaching and healthcare, just two more quick examples. So student achievement. So what's a good predictor of that? The relationship between the teacher and the student. Um, we're back to kind of trust and compassion. Yeah. Well, what about medicine? Well, they're caring about compliance with treatment. Well, what's the best predictor of that? the physician patient relationship. So the first principle on all this stuff comes down to kind of trust and compassion. That's the common to all, and there's a million other studies that make yeah. this point. Yeah. And somehow we've kind of lost what the first principle was yeah. of trust and compassion and then understanding how do you actually practice that. Yeah. Um, until right at the end, you had not used the word compliance, or we had not yet used the word compliance, because uh, I wanted to ask you about that. You know, usually people at your level have the word compliance in their title. You know, yours is just integrity and ethics. Um, so I know you're not going to give me a compliance product or tool or program that you've put in place as your, you know, your signature contribution that has 
you know, something you're so proud of, but would you share with everyone one, something you've implement, have implemented over the past several years that you're just proud of because it gets at this idea of trust. It gets at this idea of compassion throughout the company. Is there anything that, uh, that you've done that you could share with our listeners? That's a very insightful question, Arthur. Um, I'm, I'm going to answer it this way, and then you you, you can move me in the direction that you that you're trying to to, to lift up mm -hmm. for your audience. So it took a year and a half to decide whether I was going to uh, leave the academy. I was I loved what I was doing. I was a full prof, tenured, endowed chair. Uh, I drove my wife nuts on whether or not this made any sense. She just kind of got fed up with me. Just make up your freaking mind. And uh, we did a number of things to kind of pilot stuff. And so one of the initial plans from Parker was the first offer said, we'd like you to kind of put together compliance and character. And my reaction was, um, you know, I, I understand why you want that. Uh, I don't know anybody who's defined me as compliant. Um, I'm going to screw that up. So uh, and I, I think they're just two different goals yeah. that you, you need rules. I don't want to be misunderstood. You can debate whether we have too many or too few, but that's not my thing. Um, it's the character side. And so we, we took, it, it, um, they agreed after that. I kept mm -hmm. thinking they would say, um, well, go away, will you? And I, I really did think that was what was going to happen. But the outcome was, you know, that makes sense. One is intrinsic and one is extrinsic. And you've got to be pretty careful blending those two together. Yeah. So we intentionally separated them, that mm -hmm. the compliance is the push strategy and the character is the pull strategy. And so then the question to your point of, well, how would you measure whether or not anybody wanted this? Um, and so the first metric, and I report up through the chief financial officer. So mm -hmm. this is a protect the balance sheet argument. And the first question was, well, does your phone ring? I mean, these are really busy people. They're not going to give up a whole day when you start to add up the salaries in the room and the lost productivity. This better be worth their time. So that was the initial thrust. And um, the phone rang more than we could handle. <laughs> Uh, so then we said, well, crap, then maybe we should get even a little more serious on this. So what are metrics we're going to look at anyway? They're not a new metric, but we think there would be a correlation with character. And that's when we, we came down on engagement. Engagement. Yeah. So that, that's such a big part of your book is, is that increased engagement through this work. So right. thank you for, for uh, highlighting that because it really such an, a powerful part of your book. Yeah, I appreciate it. And that's, that's what we've seen big, you know, um, we've seen jumps year over year of 10, 20% in engagement scores. I mean, way beyond what I think any of us would have imagined. But then when you step back and you look at it from a, the human perspective, I mean, who the heck doesn't want to be on, on a team? Yeah. We trust each other. We care about each other. We're courageous. We're just, we're hopeful. Yeah versus who wants to be on a team where we're ruthless, <laughs> we're unfair, and we're full of despair. I mean, Watch your back. That. Yeah, yeah. Oh, it's so wonderful. I'd um, like to, to um, conclude with like four quick questions for you, you know, that um, almost like we're taking a, a walk 40 yards, and by the end of that 40 yards, I've asked the, the fourth, uh, fourth and last question. Uh, your book, again, I'm going to promote it, Exception to the Rule, was published in 2018. So the question I have for you is that have you learned anything about character, about leadership, since you co-wrote the book that you will definitely put into the second edition? Uh, without a doubt, um, it, as well as you become more and more clear about what you don't know. So uh, the direct answer to your question is um, we've got another book coming out called Better Humans, Better Performance. And um, that'll probably come out about in the fall. And so what I think it's, it's an extension of exception to the rule, but tying more tightly the performance impacts of the, the virtues, hmm. uh, both from a research perspective, what the data shows, as well as applying it to um, elite organizations, 
uh, Navy SEALs, professional athletics that we've worked with. Yeah. And I think the goal, Arthur, of that book that I don't think I was as clear about in the one that you've highlighted is how do we democratize uh, human performance based on um, character, which is certainly relevant to schools. That say, I, say more, say more, democratize, say more. Yeah. So, I, I, you know, what, I, what I've learned from organizations like the SEALs is that, um, and I'm not a military person. But um, I'm, I am interested in people who perform at an elite level and, and how do they do it. I, and we're not trying to become soldiers or athletes, astronauts. That's not the point. But all of them have learned that under pressure, you're going to default to your training. And they receive training in how to deal with pressure and stress and adversity. And so the, you know, a typical teacher, what, what training do I default to? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. there isn't any training. Mm -hmm. And... So now we're left to chance that yeah. there will be a, you know, there'll be a, a chunk of teachers that will figure it out on their own. Uh, there'll be a bunch that'll struggle and kind of muddle through, and there will some that be kind of crushed by it. That bugs the crap out of me that that's, yeah. that's a fixable problem. Um, yeah. it, I'm not saying it's easy, and I'm not suggesting that we um, can kind of quickly make these changes. I think what drives me crazy is by democratizing it, We've got evidence-based tools that we know work, but they're not widely applied. Yeah. Uh, so crystal ball time. Imagine seven years from now at Parker Hannifin, you know, what, what is one of those tools, one of those programs, one of those trainings that is not in place now that you really hope five to seven years from now, it's tightly woven into the Parker Hannifin culture what would be one of those yeah i, I think it would be an extension of some of the things we've already discussed can uh, just keep embedding it into operations that's mm -hmm. on the business side mm -hmm. but also on the personal side of um you know i think at the end of the day it's you know this field called risk management the if you kind of a metaphor of a boat and you can see the risk is, is ahead and the whole idea was steer around the storm. Well, how in the heck do you build, do you drive through a storm called the global pandemic or yeah. um, a recession or um, disruption of, a, of a, a supply chain? So you need a stronger boat. You don't need a boat that's going to steer around. And I'd argue that's also true for K through 12, for, for students as well as for teachers and administrators. We need to be building better boats. We're not going to get rid of the discomfort. We're going to have to normalize discomfort. And we're, we're not going to be having people um, kind of wish that things could go back to normal because it's not. So if that's our reality, then how do we help give people tools? So at the very least, they better cope with stress and adversity. And hopefully there's a percentage to thrive. Yeah. It's great questions, uh, uh, great responses. Two last questions, uh, both more sort of focused on your own self-reflection, because that also is a, a key part of your book, uh, how leaders have to really self-reflect and, and know thyself, if you will. So, um, you know, when I was involved in positive psychology, I had the honor before he passed away of meeting Don Clifton, uh, Gallup uh, president at the time, and he wrote this wonderful book, soar with your strengths. And that's clearly a part of what you have been writing about, which is to know your strengths, but also manage your weakness. So Peter, what is one of your signature strengths that you that shows up at your work at Parker? Yeah, I think the uh, God knows there's all kinds of weaknesses. <laughs> um, that's probably easier to go at. But it, you know, this, this as you're lifting up the strength-based approach, um, you know, I, I start, I've always wondered, does PhD really stand for permanent head damage? And um, that you, you view the whole planet as deficit-based, uh, a gap analysis. Um, I, it's taken me a long time to flip it and say, you know, oh, what does it mean to kind of um, get clear about your strengths and leveraging it? without ignoring weaknesses, because uh, you can you, it's, it can become a narcissistic project if you're not careful. So it's not the ignoring the weakness, but the flip side on strengths is uh, 
you know, the kind of normal approach in a performance evaluation is the crap sandwich, uh, say something nice, bust on them, say something nice. And there's, there's no evidence that works. So a strength-based approach, I hope I'm gotten better at this, is what do you do well? How can you do more of it? And the more you kind of increase that, it's got mercenary benefits to it. Yeah. Yeah. And it's what's the critical piece is I got to come clear on my weaknesses. Yeah. So I really what if you and I are in a team, um, really what I'm asking you is to offset my weaknesses. So I better bring something else to the table since yeah. you're saving my hide on an area where I stink. Yeah. So but what what are what's one strength that you're you're trying to maximize that you're trying to really accentuate? I think the one that I that I want to want to work on or, or no, the, your strength that, that that you're that you soar with that you know is just a dependable signature strength of yours. So this is your area of expertise. I'm going to say this with a qualifier. <laughs> um, so I, I think for a person who's had a lot of good breaks, um, you know, I haven't been scared to try to do something different and new, meaning leaving a tenured position and all that. But Arthur, you know enough about courage. I compare that to what's happening in Ukraine right now, and I look like a wuss. Yeah. Um, so it's a continuum. Is it, um, you yeah. know, compared to people that have got pretty good deals? Yeah, I think I'm reasonably courageous. Um, you want to compare me to Braveheart? No, I look like a wuss. <laughs> All right. Last question. And that is in your book, uh, the term, the phrase moral compass shows up multiple times. And I am such a believer that each one of us, whether we're 5, 15, or 55, our job is to just build our own moral compass. That boat that you were talking about, each of us have that compass that orients us. So what I want to ask you is, courage is probably part of that you know, strength of yours, so it's part of your moral compass. But what I wanted to, to know is, one of those virtues that is not a strength of yours, but it's become part of your moral compass because you know how important it is and you really had to practice, train, and really make it part of that toolbox, but it wasn't there all the time. Is there one virtue that you really say, yep, it orients me now, but it wasn't always that way? I can answer that one uh, pretty quickly, temperance. That, um, you know, I, I hope the hell there's been some progress uh, in terms of self-control, habitual change, uh, balance, moderation. Uh, but even Confucius said, I'm not sure it's humanly possible to nail all of these buggers. So I, I'm hoping the trend line is, is favorable. <laughs> um, but I, I think it's incredibly hard to put these virtues into practice under pressure despite stress, uncertainty, and to do it with people who don't plan to return the favor. Yeah. Peter, thank you so much. This was such an honor to hear you and your wisdom. And I hope this is the beginning of more conversations with you. It's been such an honor for me to have you on Character Spotlight. Thank you. Arthur, my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. It's an honor for me to be part of your organization. What you do is really important. Um, respect your leadership. And if there's ways I can be helpful. Let me know. Thank you, Peter. Bye-bye.